Hi there, and welcome back to the Energy Sector Heroes podcast. My name is Michelle Fraser, and every week I will speak with incredible people who share their lessons, experiences, and stories from their time spent in the energy sector. Hi there, and welcome back again to this week's episode. If you're new to the show, then please take a second to subscribe and even consider sharing the show with just one other person. This week I am joined by Jonathan Cohen. Jonathan is an incredible land professional with over 20 years experience in the upstream and midstream energy sector. Jonathan, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure, thank you for having me. Yeah, so like you're saying, I've been in the energy industry since 1999. I started as a landman doing just traditional tidal research and, and document imaging very early on. And that led me all the way through being a VP of land for a small drilling company. So, yep, I now do a lot of work within the, the Bitcoin space and still do energy work. And I try to bridge the two together with my company, with Petro. So that's a real brief version of me. <laughs> no, that sounds amazing. How did you get started off in the energy sector? Uh, so right out of high school, I had a small company that would just do consulting for people doing computer work. And one of my first big clients was a VP of land for a firm out of Houston. And he basically taught me the, the industry inside and out from the perspective of competitive land acquisitions. So that's that's what got me started in, in energy. Okay. So have you always worked in in the land? Yeah. Is that yeah. Not, yeah. 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 So uh yeah, I've always worked in land. You know, I started by learning how to run title, then leasing, then eventually I, I got introduced into the technology called GIS. Geographic Information Systems, and that is what you now experience a lot in Google Maps and those types of services. And it's basically the idea that a map can be tied to a database and you can do dashboards, analysis, reporting, you can do asset tracking, just just a lot of things that you can do from an enterprise standpoint with that type of technology. And, And I've just applied that on top of my land experience to the world of upstream and midstream oil and gas. And recently also to the world of Bitcoin mining because the prospecting component of it is similar, especially within the the scope of the GIS methodologies. Okay, I was just wondering, you were saying that, I was just wondering, how do you apply something like Google Maps to the oil and gas industry? Oh, you know, I, I'd i say that's where you start. Uh, you start with geology and geophysics. You start by knowing where the rock history is and then having a thesis for where the rock would potentially trap or hold hydrocarbons. And you develop a plan to drill and perforate into that formation. And so it's all about that. It's always been about maps. You know, t- traditional well wars used to be like a very defined dome structure or like a salt dome or something like that, or like a some type of like trap, right? And so these are things that are very distinct relative to their, their neighboring geology. So you can very easily map them, either through things like seismic or geochem or even just surface uh, geology. But, but I mean, this story starts, you know, back in, in the Northeast and down in, in South, Southeast Texas and kind of goes from there. And as, as oil and gas exploration developed and mapping got better and we went from just doing surface geology to having access to tools like subsurface Geophysics, right? Having having seismic as a tool, and and then later on we began to apply information science and big data to those data sets, and so that's a lot of what 
what I've tried to focus in on is, is how to leverage that those methodologies. Okay. That sounds amazing, actually, and really interesting. So did you have any role models during your career, and why did you find them inspirational? I don't know that I would put him in the camp of role model, but I definitely had a mentor. <laughs> and uh, he, he taught me what I know about land acquisition and competitive plays. And we just kind of saw different paths break off early on just because his, his techniques were quite aggressive and could potentially land a young landman uh, in a lot of heat. And I just didn't want to play in that game. But competitive acquisitions like what he did was known as blockbusting. It's not nearly as common now, but definitely what he taught me was how to deconstruct title instead of just construct it, which was a very useful tool to have as, as a land professional. Okay. Um, what is the most uh, challenging thing about your current role? Oh man, business development. <laughs> You're always looking for the next thing. When you're an entrepreneur, you're always having to search for your next client. So I'd say that's always a challenge. Other than that, you know, keeping up with the, the technology lately has been more challenging because things are moving so fast in every direction. AI largely to blame for some of that, but also just the world of, of macroeconomics and, and the world in general. I mean, driving the world towards a Bitcoin adoption has been significant. You're, you're starting to see, you know, people like Kennedy's mentioning it, running for president. And, and eventually that, that does trickle down into the energy world because there is a link between at least stranded energy in the form of stranded natural gas and in many cases just stranded formations, entire formations, uh, due to economic, uh, you know, conditions. And Bitcoin mining opens that up. It, it, it basically leverages the, the component of being able to take that energy and turning it into a monetary asset right there on the spot. So the market goes to the molecule, which is a very different paradigm from the market having to be built to the molecule through a pipeline. And then you're left only to that one market participant that built that pipeline because he kind of has a monopoly. As, as a producer, that market is very limited. And now with something like Bitcoin mining, we're seeing the ability for even marginal wells that would be potential candidates for plugging, reaching almost a, a second or third end of life boost through through these methods. So super interesting that, that, you know, something that I would have never really initially thought when I first heard of Bitcoin, that it would be end up, end up having such an impact on, on the world of oil and gas. But that's what I'm working on now. It's just kind of how to bridge those two those two together and and making the case for oil, oil and gas companies and for Bitcoin miners that their their models have a lot of similarities and they are good hedges for one another in the, in the sense that they're not the, the the price of bitcoin is not tied to the price of natural gas and neither one is tied necessarily independently to the price of the dollar they have their own market dynamics and so that's super valuable for both of them as a producer right so if i'm an oil and gas producer and I have the ability to sell natural gas at, to the market and the gas market is $2, but I can mine Bitcoin and make five to $8, depending on the price of Bitcoin for mining Bitcoin with that same gas. The, the economics for my wells suddenly change. So it's material and, and it's impactful. And but I see there being a lot of benefit to the two worlds kind of meeting. Okay. That was interesting because I mean, Bitcoin is quite popular, and it has been for a while. Do you think it? Do you think it can impact the energy sector? Does it go hand in even hand in hand with the energy sector? How how does it work together? 
Yeah, I, I think there's many parallels, you know, but there's also just natural fits from the perspective of internationally what, what this technology means is that Bitcoin is a money that is not controlled by any one government, which then gives international players the ability to, to do transactions without having to trust the other person's settlement means. So I don't have to worry about the risk of settlement in yuan or in pesos. I can just send you Bitcoin and I don't have to worry about sending you a ship full of gold to settle something. There's no pirates coming for the shipment. You know, I can just actually settle for for the item and, and potentially risk some volatility within a 30 minute window. But that's that's very limited, and you're you're essentially guaranteeing that transaction gets there in 30 minutes for fifty dollars, sixty dollars, and it could be billions of dollars in the amount of the transaction. So. Um, it will eventually be used by very large organizations. We're starting to see very large organizations adopt it. You know, Larry Fink is a very influential person in the world of macro and just Wall Street in general. And if he's touting Bitcoin's praises, then you know, obviously there's some sticking power. Uh, considering not a year ago. The, the two could not have been more different. So eventually people come around to the fact that the important feature of Bitcoin is that it's not controlled by anybody and that there is only 21 million. So you have, you have an asset that cannot be inflated and that's very useful. That cannot be inflated and cannot be manipulated by third points. And I think that's really useful for oil and gas as a whole. Since oil and gas is a very international enterprise, I, I also think from the perspective of programmable money, there's a lot of interesting applications. If if I can get, and I'm working on a project that's doing just this, if I can get the midstream's meter to talk to the producer's meter and validate that, you know, within a certain threshold, one meter matched up with the other meter, they're in essence validating an invoice before it happens. And, and if that invoice is then paid programmatically through something like Bitcoin, number one, there is no more need for reconciliations. So roughly 30% of the cost of, of accounting goes away. Number two, the cash lag and the cash risk that that, that exercise of 30 to 90 days of having to wait from when I, I, the producer, give you the midstream, the product, to when I get paid, that goes away. So it fixes a lot of problems in the way that we currently do business. And it's math. You know, it's, it's, it's programs that we can all agree with that make business more efficient. And if I were to go to any CFO and say, would you like to be more efficient and have it cost you less money, have you have more accurate records? I think they all agree and nod their heads yes. So it's just a matter of education now to get these systems that are, think of them more like Bitcoin is email for money and, and how email got transformed into a tool for business. We're still figuring it out, but it certainly did impact the world. And I, I think we'll see a lot of this, a lot of those parallels in Bitcoin. Okay. That's quite interesting, actually. You're also saying that you find that business development is quite is quite difficult, and I agree. Actually, it's probably one of the hardest things you can do. But why do you find it difficult? What are the challenges you can face doing it? You know, I, I definitely think the outside environment is one thing. Um, you know, companies go, especially in oil and gas, it, it tends to ebb and flow as an industry, and a lot of crypto and Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin in general is the same. And there's definitely ebbs and flows. So the longevity of your of your clientele is some sometimes an issue on both markets. I'd say in land, it's very transactional because you have this 
box of land that you're interested in. So once you're done doing the research for that, say quarter mile or half mile or square mile of, of land that's going to be producing oil and gas, you have to move on to the next one. So depending on how much acquisition capital there is, there's the appetite for that title research in order to do that, that acquisition. And that typically is reserved in times like today for more mineral buying and royalty acquisition rather than straight out title work for, for land acquisition. A lot of that has to do with the, the shale booms did away with a lot of the land acquisition because they accomplished it. So a lot of the basins are, have been well combed now. So it's more of a M&A and due diligence efforts, effort that now you, you have as a ongoing client need. So it's just a different market structure, I think, that, that you have to deal with during different market periods. And, and that's part of the challenge. Okay. But how do you overcome them challenges, though? So I am very proactive on trying to give value back to my community. And, and so I do a lot of outreach through posting a Bitcoin meetup in Fort Worth. I also work with the university, TCU, my alma mater, on some of those events. And I attend, you know, industry conferences like NAPE and participate in, in professional uh, social environments like uh, Fort Worth Association Petroleum Landman and, and just, you know, try to get out and meet people. This is, uh, it's still oil and gas and still, you know, you have to know somebody and to shake hands. And so uh, I try to do as much of that as I can, as well as put out material online that I think is, is valuable for people. So if you go to my website, you can go to the sample maps and go to the U.S. energy map. And I, I publish a lot of free data there so you can see what we do and you can see at least the source data that we use to do a lot of our, our work. Okay. That sounds amazing, actually. I'm going to have a look at that, actually. Have you ever encountered any career disasters? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I'd say what caused me to leave the the small EMP that I was part of, I would say that was a career disaster. And, you know, just bad timing, bad luck and bad decisions. And you just have to deal with them. Okay. So how did you, okay. So how do you overcome a bad decision then? Well, in my case, it was having to step away. Uh, I just didn't have another option. I was not a majority owner of the company, even though I was a founder, founding member, but it just, Sometimes your only recourse is to walk away from a bad deal. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Uh, that was that was the option that I was faced with, and so I had to take that decision. That would be quite hard to to walk away from a from say a bad deal because how would you even know that you have made one actually? If you've made maybe yeah, if you've made maybe. Well, so- not, not it's not always you making the bad decisions you know you, you are bound to your partners you're, you're very much in a sort of marriage with your partners and so when somebody acts it's not it's not them alone it's you in concert because it's the it's the company so it just being a business owner has its challenges because it's not just you it is and that would be that would be quite a an an immense pressure as well, so. Yeah, but, you know, again, move on. We hope everybody does well going forward. And that's the best you can do. Yeah. How do you find running your own business? For me, it would be quite stressful because if you have other, other people that work for you as well, you would have an enorm- enormous pressure to make sure that your com- company was successful. Yeah, it is stressful at times. It is rewarding at other times, you know, when you're doing really well and you've got several clients kind of kicking at the same time and things are good. And then you have lean times and you just have to learn to kind of navigate those waters. Okay. 
So what made you go into business by yourself other than working for someone else? Was that a conscious decision that you always wanted to do? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say I always lean towards entrepreneurship, but you know you have to start working for others, and so a lot of my initial days in oil and gas was you know working as a broker, working contract, and and being a business owner is very similar to that. That you're doing a lot of contract work as a business, you're just negotiating differently than if you were going in as a contract laborer. You just it's a different, it's a different negotiation, but it it's, tends to be very similar work. And yeah, I mean that's kind of the nature of of business development. It's you you're you're doing the work of the people you're managing. In so far as like you, you're the last one that has to see that work out the door, and so you got to make sure it's good. But is it long hours though? Do you, do you feel that you have to put in more hours working for yourself? Yeah, but they are more flexible hours. That's how I answer that. <laughs> but yeah, you definitely have to put in the work. Okay. It sounds amazing, actually, to have your, to have your, your own successful business, actually. But I think it would be quite hard work to do that. So if you were going to hire a graduate what would you look for? What qualities would you look for? Well, I'm doing some of that work right now. And I'd say I'd look at the task and try to see the comfort of the person that's that's trying to accomplish that task with the task and see if, if they're passionate about the task, even if they don't fully understand it, if they, they want to learn about it. And then just their general attitude towards, you know, raising their hand and being not necessarily being expected to do something, but expecting something of themselves. So I think that's, those are important characters to have. So definitely, you know, measure them against their environmental like footprint that they're going to have in the company and then measure them as far as like just the person that you're going to hire. Okay. That sounds amazing. What is your zone of genius? What are you most good at? Putting dots together. <laughs> yeah, I'd say that's pretty meta, uh, considering what I do with mapping and doing, like literally, that some of the mapping that I do is making heat maps. So it's doing mathematical functions that say what is near me is most like me, and so it's interpolating the, the number between two points in space. So connecting dots. <laughs> But is the math quite hard then? The software's doing it for me. I'm not I'm not necessarily doing all that math by hand. Uh, I think it's important to understand what the math is doing so that you know what your output is and what what degree of error is baked into that output. Because there's models or, or models that are not in the real world, right? I do agree, actually. But why is it, and I understand the, the theory behind why you've got to to know if you're doing maybe a calculation or even just taking an engineering decision of why you would need to know the theory behind it. But is it really important to to know the theory about why you're implementing? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example. Of what So yeah. one of the ways that I use, let's call it, geospatial analysis in a way that's maybe novel because I understand what's going on is I can take the, the ways that geologists and geophysics interpret their data into maps that look like heat maps and look like isopacks and look like, you know, the things that you would normally associate with geology and geophysics. And then take similar tools, maybe not the same tools, but similar mathematical tools, and apply them to the electric grid, and apply them to population densities, and apply them to different generation sources. And if you can do that, then you can create like weighted maps for for the the things that would matter to a Bitcoin miner as far as where they would want to buy 
land next to power that's cheap. So I'm, I'm very much doing the same type of prospecting the data that I would be doing in oil and gas, but I'm applying it to a different, you know, industry. And, and so if I can do it for something like a Bitcoin miner, then it's easy for me to apply the same logic to something like a solar um, farm or a wind farm and prospect for those types of renewable assets. So uh, all of these things require you to know, A, how to prospect them for, for that asset, but then actually the, the know-how of going to the courthouse and figuring out who owns it at the appraisal district, and running the title, depending on whether it's surface or mineral back, however far back you need it, and then figuring out who owns what. Uh, and that's still very much old school, traditional land. It's just, I'm, I'm putting the GIS big data spin on it, which is, uh, I mean, it used to be Photoshop, <laughs> but we've gotten a little bit past those tools for, for doing land analysis and, and resource analysis. And, um, yeah, that's my spin on it. Yeah, I agree. Actually, it is important to to know what the theory behind a major decision that you're taking. Actually, so is there anything that you still want to achieve in your career? Oh yeah, uh, I want to make lots more money. I I would love to continue to build the community that I'm building in Fort Worth around the energy and Bitcoin space. Um, I think that this town has a, a special fit with those two industries. The city of Fort Worth was the first municipality to mine Bitcoin. And it was also kind of the, the, the city that brought in the idea of shale production as something that was big in the energy world. And so Dallas, Fort Worth became a hub for energy because of the Barnett shale. And I think that is going to see another chapter play out with Bitcoin in it, and I hope to be part of that. That sounds amazing, actually. So I'm going to ask you maybe one final question. If you could turn back time, would you change anything? Sure. I would be tougher on myself. I would be more selective about my partners. <laughs> and I yeah, would just focus on those two things, be tougher on myself and be more careful who I who I play with. Okay, why would you be tougher on yourself? Just cause I, you you achieve more when you are tougher on yourself, I believe. And so, yeah, I, I'm a prior uh, service member from the Army Reserves. Played rugby, and both of those experience experiences taught me that. And, yeah, my wife's a super hard worker, so I, a lot of my life has taught me that lesson. Okay. That's an amazing answer, actually. So, that's all the questions I have today. I'd like to thank Jonathan for your time. That brings us to the end of another episode. Thanks for listening and see you next week. That brings us to the end of another episode. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, I'd like to gently encourage you to leave a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts and share the show with another person. You can also follow me on LinkedIn or via my website, www.michellefraserconsultancy.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.